Northwest had Indiana overtime, our second time in front of the camera today, our, our first with uh, without the music blaring behind us. But this is Inside Indiana Overtime. Alex McCarthy, I'm Zach Ostrom. We're talking about Indiana 83, uh, Purdue 55. This is, I believe, the first time in history that Indiana has ever affected back-to-back 20-plus -back point wins on Purdue. Uh, career high for Will Sheehy, 22 points. Program record, 9 of 9 from the field. Most field goals made in the game without missing uh, a single shot. Uh, Cody Zeller, 19 and 9, 7 of 12 uh, from the floor. Christian Watford had uh, the, his team's first eight points and, and 14 overall, so another good night for him. And, and really, just a pretty comprehensive. Uh, you know, we'll talk about all the depot, Victor all the depot in a second, but but uh, just another comprehensive win. You know, for Indiana over a pretty clearly overmatched Purdue team. Yeah, I mean, we saw it at Purdue, and we saw it here. That I mean, the talent gap is just too big for Purdue to really even. Um, you know, effectively keep it close for more than 10 or 15 minutes. And um, as the game went along, you know, Tom Cream was saying a lot yesterday, actually he said it a lot this season, that he just wants to see his team get better throughout games. He wants to... He's actually uh, said that a lot over the last five years. Yeah, yeah I mean, and, I, and I'm sure every coach wants to see that. But tonight against Purdue, they did that exact thing. They shot better in the second half than they did in the... Indiana shot better in the second half than it did in the first half. Uh, it outscored Purdue by more by a few points more in the second half than it did in the first half. And they just, I mean, they just stayed in front of them the whole way, and they were able to take out their starters with a few minutes left, and it, it kind of was bench on bench kind of at the end with a couple guys falling out for Purdue, and, I mean, you know, the final few minutes were... Yeah, I mean, Creek, Maurice Creek at seven minutes, yeah. Remy Abel eight, uh, Jeremy Hollow 14, Derek Elson 11. So, I mean, there, there was yeah. definitely more bench yeah, contribution. Yeah, we saw Hannah Perea get a few minutes uh, as well. But it, you know, there really are actually quite a few parallels, I think, and, and Tom Green talks a little bit about this post game, and I think more just generally, this has kind of been a narrative that people have, I don't want to say have supported, but but that has kind of been repeated uh, for Indiana and, and Purdue this year. Is that there are a lot of parallels with this Purdue team with Indiana a couple years ago? Um, you know, just not consistent offensively, too young. Uh, you know, I mean, Matt Painter admitted tonight that this is probably as frustrated as he's ever been um, with the team, and uh, at least one that he's had at Purdue. And, uh, you know, particularly defensively, they just they, they struggle with communication. They struggle with a lot of the mechanics of defense rotations, you know, switching screens, getting around screens, understanding spacing. Um, you know, I mean, there, there were just... You know, they, I thought they played harder, at least in spurts, than they did in West Lafayette. They didn't just seem quite so just totally overwhelmed mm -hmm. by what was happening like they did in West Lafayette. But every time they would cut the lead to 10 or 12 or, or 14 points, you just see Indiana. I mean, just the, the buckets that they would get to answer were just – they just came way too easily. And, you know, I, 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 without sounding all doom and gloom, and we won't talk too much about Purdue, it is kind of hard right now. Um, you know, to see a lot of immediate improvement in that group. I mean, they started three freshmen today, um, and and they played, what, at least a couple more off the bench. So certainly they've got time to develop, and Painter is obviously very well respected as a coach. Tom Crean was full of praise for him after the game. But you look at that team and you do kind of wonder where it's going a, a, a little bit. But... Um, we're not talking about Purdue. This is not inside Purdue over time. Um, big talking point today, Alex, and I know you, you wrote a story about this, uh, Victor Oladipo. Kind of weird, a play that nobody really saw. Yeah. I, mean, I, I guess I guess the ESPN replay showed he rolled his ankle. I, I could not tell how exactly. Um, he walked off under his own power. You know, Tom Crean said that, that he tried to do s some, some things – in yeah, the locker room or in the hallway outside the locker room to, to maybe try and test it around halftime. He didn't come back out with the rest of the team at half. He came back out after the second half had started. He was on the exercise bike very briefly, and, and then he spent the rest of the game on the bench. And, and Cream basically said, you know, it was kind of touch and go, and, and there just wasn't enough comfort to let him back in the game. And there really wasn't a necessity. Yeah, really I'm sure that was to... part of the thought process. Yeah. If this had been Michigan second half, maybe they would have tried to figure out a way to get him in. Um, but, you know, with, with Indiana, pretty comfortable, um, even when the score was a little bit closer. And and with Michigan State on Tuesday, I think it was sort of a, a better safe than sorry attitude taken. But it, it, it's – Green said it's day-to-day, -day, but it, it, I think – 
you know, if, if, if we had to pick right now, I think you'd probably say he's he will be starting in East Lansing barring something un, unexpected. Yeah, I mean, I, that's what I would kind of expect, and that's what it looked like Oladipo would expect. I mean, it looked like he was ready to mm-hmm. get back into this game. He came, you know, sometimes when you see someone go to the locker room at halftime uh, with an injury, or, you know, before halftime with an injury, you see him come out in sweatpants or something like that, and he came out looking exactly the same as he looks. I mean, I mean, he just stayed in his uniform and was ready. And every time Tom Green would walk by him, he, Oladipo would kind of peek his head forward. But, well, he said, I mean, you know, Green, it, Green said he, that he wanted, he wanted to, come, to in. come back in. And yeah, and he was always up. jumping off the bench to get into the huddle during timeout. And he was yelling to guys on the floor. So, I mean, it, it looked like he was mentally still in it and ready, as ready as he could be physically to yeah. come back into tonight's game. And with three days or so to, to get ready for that Michigan State game. I, I would expect him to to be able to play, and maybe he won't be quite 100%, but you you would think that that he, I mean, it's not like he's a, he's one of the harder working guys on this team, and you know he's going to get ready for, for a Michigan State game that is, you know, as important well, as any well, game they've played this year. I mean, year. It's pro- right now it's probably the game of the year in the Big Ten. It's, yeah. it's for a spot. It's it's for uh, it's for sole possession of first place with four games left. Once it's over, both teams will have four games left. So, you know, and and theoretically, at least in terms of what we're talking, you know, I mean, if they tied, uh, let's let's say at the end of the year, let's say Indiana wins in East Lansing, and then at the end of the year they wind up tied in the Big Ten standings overall. Um, Indiana, they, they would share the Big Ten title technically, but Indiana would have the number one seed going into the Big Ten tournament, and they would have the tiebreaker, you would assume, in the eyes of the NCAA selection committee, barring something else unforeseen, some right. unseemly losses somewhere else down the line. Because they would have um, beat them twice. Because, yeah, yeah, because if you're camp- comparing two teams and one has won both, both of their meetings. Um, you know, but, but, but the prognosis right now, Kareen says, is sprained ankle, he said. He said somewhere between precautionary and day to day, which which is basically we didn't want to play him for the rest of the night. We didn't yeah. need to play him for the rest of the night. We kept him on the bench. We'll evaluate him tomorrow. You know, it, it, again, this is really more just supposition or gut feeling. There's probably a little bit of gamesmanship in there, trying to keep, uh, you know, is a Tom Izzo and his staff a little bit in the dark. Um, it, certainly, his teammates seem pretty confident yeah. that he would be ready to play against. Yeah, they were joking uh, about uh, against yeah. Michigan State. So. And you would think, I mean, he was. He was bouncing around on the bench. You would think somebody who's in real pain isn't going to be able to do that. So, um, you know, we could be totally off base, and, and he could be, he could miss the trip to, uh, to East Lansing or at least not play in it. But, but right now the prognosis seems very good for Indiana. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you know, one of the big talking points tonight, Will Sheehy, 9 of 9, 2 of 2 from, from, the three, from behind the three-point line, 22 points. And really – I thought there was in particular just kind of a, you know, and this isn't to take away from Sheehy's performance, but, but you know, I thought his performance was just kind of stereotypical of what Indiana can get offensively when it's playing well. A lot of his points came from activity. Yeah. They came from really good off-ball movement. They came from, from alertness, you know, to to seeing there who likes to. From and it was just, lot, yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it was kind of one of those performances that, Sheehy earned his points not just with good shooting, but just with really smart basketball. I mean, just just smart play. And yeah. I think that this offense really has become one this year in particular and, and through much of last year too that does reward that. And I think that's why Sheehy did well tonight. Yeah, and it's, it's a very typical thing. of We see that from Sheehy all the time is that he uh, pursues uh, – he, he rushes to the basket – as aggressively as anyone you see, you know, whether it's to get a rebound, whether it's um, to look for the ball to try and score, or whether it's on the defensive end too. Uh, and we saw that a lot tonight, you know, on a, on a fast break, we saw uh, him kind of slip behind the defense and get in great position there. We, just his cuts tonight were, were quick and decisive. And, you know, like you said a few minutes ago, the, the Purdue defense struggles to communicate at times, and a lot of times someone gets lost in the shuffle a little bit and they're open under the basket and yeah. you know when when you have as much experience as holes and as you know as much experience and ability as as feral that's going to hurt you a lot and she he was that guy who was able to get there and in the second half he had he had tons of time 16, to 16 yeah he had 16 points and he had tons so of time to be good, on the court maybe a good reaction from him to to losing all the deep right right and he you know he had the the minutes and the he, he said tonight he had the opportunity he had the minutes to 
really be aggressive and as shots kept falling he kept being more and more aggressive and figuring out ways to to score in that second half and it was just kind of a a perfect situation for or, you know you don't want to say that a guy getting injured is a perfect situation for anyone but to have that opportunity to really spread his wings and really to be um, that sixth starter that that Crean always says he is um, that he he really took advantage of that second half did he spread his wing I, is he like a peacock I don't, gotta let me fly, listen. Captain. I'm a peacock, Captain. You gotta let me fly. Peacocks don't fly. Um, Will Ferrell movies are great. You know, the, the other thing tonight, and I mean, and without picking too much on Purdue, I know they're not a very good, and not a great offensive team either, but I mean, they don't shoot uh, 40% from the floor in either half. Um, they only go to the free throw line 14 times. They shoot less than 38% for the game. They're out-rebounded. Um, and in fact, only two of their, only two Purdue players... Uh, finished shooting at least 50%. Jacob Lawson made one jumper. He's one of one. He just made a jumper, I think, somewhere uh, late in the first half. And uh, and Anthony Day, Anthony Johnson, excuse me, not Anthony Davis, not Anthony Davis. Uh, Anthony Johnson hit two shots, like, at the very end of the game um, to finish four of eight. Other than that, nobody finished. Actually, I take that back. Rafael Davis was two of three. He also fouled out. So, um, you know, it, it was... Again, I mean, Purdue, Purdue fought a little harder. I mean, you, you felt a little bit less, again, like they were just totally overwhelmed by what was happening. But tonight, I think you still saw, or today anyway, you still just kind of saw, what, we talked about this a little bit against Nebraska, what you want to see from Indiana in a game like this, in a season like this. You know, it's a rivalry game, but you don't get tripped up, you know, you're, com- you're as commanding as you should be, basically. Um, and, you know, the truth is Indiana probably really only has one more opponent this year, Iowa at home in a couple of weeks, where you'd say, but you know, that, 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 that yeah. you know, that's that should be a pretty easy one to lock up. Um, so, you got, you know, Indiana in the middle of a Big Ten schedule or a Big Ten title race, they got to take them where they can get them. Yeah, when you have an opportunity to – when you face someone who you – should and who you have the ability to beat by 25 or 30 and you beat them by 25 or 30 that's that's what you want to be doing in these games and and then you know when you travel to Michigan State or to Minnesota that's when things get a little bit dicier and that's when you you know mm-hmm. have to really scrap to win well and i mean at the end of the day that's you know i think if if you told an indiana fan that on february 16th they would have swept purdue by a combined 65 points um, they'd have 23 wins. They'd be 11 and two in the conference, tied for first, going to East Lansing with a chance to play for first place. Um, you know, I mean, obviously they were the Big Ten favorite. I mean, I don't really know if we should call them the preseason favorite to win the national title. Um, I mean, I know what Vegas odds say. I don't necessarily think that being ranked number one in the preseason means you're the favorite to win the national title. It just means that in the preseason, you're the team people have the most confidence in to be elite that year that's that's honestly more what I feel but you know this is where Indiana was basically expected to be that said they're here and I think there were some questions preseason about you know this group as talented as it is can they take that step can they really understand how to be elite can they adjust their mentality from being a hunter from being an underdog to being the hunted to being the, the team that everybody else is gunning for can they you know, can they really kind of keep improving the way they did last year when, you know, they, they, they aren't constantly sort of, you know, chirping about this idea that, that they want more respect than they're getting? Um, and, and can they really just kind of learn to behave like a favorite? We saw them lose games last year. They shouldn't have. You know, if they don't, if they don't screw around with a 10-point – I mean, I don't remember – I believe – the, the co-Big Ten champions last year all were 13-5 and five in the conference. So if they don't screw around with a 10-point lead at Nebraska and they don't let Matt Gatons just, just, just bury them at Iowa, they win a share of the conference title this year. Obviously, you know, somebody tweeted at me after the game and said they should be 13-0 and no missed opportunities. Well, everybody's got missed opportunities. This year, the reality is more often than not in Big Ten play, they have done what was required of them. They have been as good as, if not better than, over the course of the whole season. Every other team in the Big Ten, in the in the best conference in America, and they've put themselves in a position to, to play for you know, a, a crucial first place. Obviously, if they lose in East Lansing, as long as it's competitive, there's no shame in that. But they're at least giving themselves that chance. 
we will, I would imagine, be back to talk about that uh, Tuesday. Yep. We'll, we'll probably we'll be, be talking to Tom Crean. Yeah, we'll be in Bloomington. Bloomington. There's a credential shortage. We'll, we, we will have people in East Lansing. We will not be those people uh, because there was, in fact, a credential shortage and not enough room. But it is what Believe it is. Or not, people want to. A lot of people want to go to that game. Yeah, yeah. That's. I, I mean, that that might be one of the games of the year, um, one way or the other. Uh, for now, we are done, and I'm going to go home and I don't know, just Sleep. clean out my nose. Uh, for Alex McCarthy, I'm Zach Osterman. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. You've been watching Inside Indiana Overtime.